Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Williams with Creekstone Integrated Care right here in Amarillo, Texas. I wanted to preface this week's entry by saying I've had discussions on this topic with different medical radiologists before. Now my question, as we talked about in part one of this series that we did last week, uh, the question was if a low back or a lumbar disc is say four millimeters herniated while a person is lying in an MRI tube, what happens when the patient sits up and becomes weight bearing? Will the herniation increase or be affected at all? All of them stated that they supposed it's possible but not likely considering the strength of the disc itself. But in my opinion, if the disc is thinned, degenerated or weakened by injury or all of the above, then why wouldn't extra pressure on the disc accentuate or increase the bulge or, her or herniation? That's when I started searching um, for research on PubMed on the internet for papers uh, that had to do with this topic. Now, continuing with part two of this discussion, we'll start with this study by D.S. Choi called Magnetic Resonance Imaging of the Lumbosacral Spine Under Compression. Now here's why they did it. Evidently, sitting MRI imaging uh, exists at Harvard and Zurich um, since most MR MRI machines, they can't accomplish this sort of imaging. The, the author of the paper wanted to see if in a regular machine, compression could be dependably added to the spine in order to uh, duplicate the pressures found in the low back discs when people are in the seated position. Now here's how they did it. The author created a plywood compression frame that was able to be used in a standard MRI machine. When applied, the patient lying in the MRI machine would be subject to similar compression forces as those experienced when sitting up. Now here's what they found. They could reproduce the symptoms in 50% of the patients through applying the compression. And here's the finding that led me to include this study into this discussion. Uh, the author was, was able to also reproduce augmentation or was able to accentuate the disc herniation by applying the compression. So let's wrap it up. The compression applied allowed the author to reproduce the forces experienced when a person sits. It reproduced the symptomatology in half of the subjects and the compression caused the disc to herniate further. Now, continuing with the second paper here in this week's blog, it's by Nowicki et al. called Occult Lumbar Lateral Spinal Stenosis in Neuroforamina Subjected to Physiologic Loading. And this paper's from 1996. And here's why they did it. These authors, they were interested in how different positioning of the trunk affects the relationships of the bones and discs in regards to the neural structures of the same anatomic region. They also wanted to find out how disc degeneration responds to loading. Now here's how they did it. The authors used cadavers for this study and looked at each vertebral segment, L1 on top of L2 or uh, L5 on top of S1 for example. And they did this via uh, CT or CAT scans and uh, MRI scans. The, studies were, the study was done uh, loaded frozen in situ, re-examined with CT, and sectioned with a cryomicrotome. The neural foramina, or the holes in the that the spinal nerves run, run through in the spine, they were classified in the following ways. Number one, no evident stenosis. Number two, having stenosis. Number three, having occult stenosis. And number four, showing resolved stenosis. Also studied was the effect of spinal level, disc type, and load type on the prevalence of the stenosis. So here's what they found. The average finding in the paper was that extension, backwards, flexion, lateral bending, and rotation show contact or compression of the spinal nerve by the ligamentum flavum, or the disc, in 18% of the neural foramina. Extension loading produced the most cases of nerve root contact. Disc degeneration significantly increased the prevalence of pain, of pain from stenosis. <clears throat> now, let's wrap it up. Uh, the authors in this paper, 
concluded that the study supports the concept of dynamic spinal stenosis, meaning intermittent stenosis of the neural foramina. Flexion, extension, lateral bending, and rotation significantly change the anatomic relationships of the ligamentum flavum and the intervertebral disc to the spinal nerve roots. So that's, that's pretty important. So we're starting to understand that positioning and weight bearing does indeed have an effect on the discs, the ligamentum flavum, and the neural structures present at each level of the spine. And here's the last one we'll cover this week here in part two. This one's called the diagnostic effect from axial loading of the lumbar spine during computed tom tomography or CT and magnetic resonance imaging in patients with degenerative disorders. This one was published in the prestigious Spine Journal. Now here's why they did it. While imaging through CT or MRI scans is becoming more popular these days, they're still done in the supine or unloaded position lying down. Basically, people are lying down in a tube rather than sitting, right? The author's stated goal in this paper uh, was to find out if there was any real value in imaging patients that had actual loads or simulated weight bearing applied in cases of degenerative spines. And here's how they did it. A device was used to induce a load on the low back before imaging. 172 patients were examined with compression applied. 50 of those were imaged with CTs. 122 of those subjects were imaged with MRIs. Any changes in the major anatomy of the region uh, was noted. Now here's what they found. Additional valuable information was found in 50 of the original 172 participants. A narrowing of the lateral recess causing compression of the nerve root was found at 42 levels in 35 patients upon axial loading. So let's wrap it up. There is certainly and frequently additional information that can be gathered for diagnostic purposes when the imaging is done with weight bearing loads applied. This included those with neurogenic claudication as a result of stenosis, but also in sciatica patients. We're starting to see a bit of a trend here, I believe. We still have part three and part four coming up in this series, so make sure you don't miss it. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to share our videos with someone that you think will find them helpful and interesting. We greatly appreciate your help spreading the word. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our channel and find us all over social media like Facebook, Google+, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as our websites at www.creekstonecare.com and www.creekstonecare.com. AmarelloChiropractor.com. Again, I'm Dr. Jeff Williams with Creekstone Integrated Care right here in Amarillo, Texas. We'll see you next week.